So I'm Corey Alexander, and I go by flavors of Corey J.A. on the internet. And my talk is titled, Using Rust and Battlesnake to Never Stop Learning. So we're going to jump right into it. We're going to need a little bit of background to get started. So let's start with, what is Battlesnake? So this is Battlesnake. I thought it would make sense to look at a game to get started. So here's my snake, Hovering Hobbs. They're the orange snake with the puffin head. And they're competing against Fang Fiend by Justin. And uh, in Battlesnake, you can unlock new heads and tails. So Hobbs won this by being the People's Choice winner one past tournament. And Hobbs and Fang are going to run around this board, trying to eat the red food pellets and avoid running into other snakes or the edge of the board. It's kind of like the old Nokia snake game, if you're familiar with that. The goal is to be the last snake alive on the board. So each of these snakes is going to try to outmaneuver the other, eat some more food, and trap the other snake. I picked this game personally, so of course we're going to watch Hobbs take the win here at the end. Sorry about that, Fang Fiend. So now that we've seen a game, we kind of know that Battlesnake is a coding game. You're building the brain of one of these snakes. You compete against developers from all over the world trying to build a snake that will survive the longest on the board. I'm going to give a quick rundown of the basic rules of Battlesnake. It's, not, it's, it's OK if you miss some of these. It's not super important to talk, but I think it helps to explain the game a bit first. So in Battlesnake, the goal is to be the last snake alive on the board. Each turn, you decide which direction you want your snake to go. Up, down, left, or right. Each snake has a health, of a, has a health that starts at 100, and it goes down by 1 each turn. Eating those red food pellets increases your health to 100 and increases the length of your snake by 1. If two snake heads land on the same square at the same time, the longer one wins and the smaller snake is eliminated. And if the snakes are the same length, they're both eliminated. On each turn, the game engine sends a request to all the competitors with the full details of the board, where all the snakes are, their healths, and where any food might be. Each snake has 500 milliseconds to, respond, to return a response with their move, up, down, left, or right. The most important thing to take away from this is that 500 milliseconds. Each turn, you only have half a second to decide which direction to go. That means that every moment is vital. Today's talk is going to follow my journey through building my first few snakes and some of the learnings along the way. I'm a Ruby web developer by trade, an avid Battlesnake player, and I've been using Rust to build my snakes and learn about memory representations, benchmarks, flame graphs, and more along the way. We'll see how Rust and Battlesnake help me keep learning and growing as a developer while also having fun. So why Rust? Like I said, I'm a Ruby developer by day, so why did I choose Rust for my snakes? Well, first off, because I enjoyed it, and still do, and a bit because I knew Rust was going to be faster than Ruby, and in Battlesnake, like I mentioned, speed matters. I also wanted to use Battlesnake as a way to keep learning and growing as a developer. I didn't know Rust before, and I wanted to try something different than the Ruby that I was used to. And since, Rust, or since Battlesnake is a competitive game, it kept me coming back and learning new tricks and more about Rust along the way, so I think it worked out really well for me. So my first snake. My first snake was a pretty simple snake. It looked just at the current board to decide where to go. Maybe there was food to the left, and I was getting hungry, so I needed to go that way. Or maybe there was a smaller snake to the right that I could try to trap. Quickly, though, I wanted something more complex for my snake. Simulating moves. So now instead of just looking at the current board, I wanted to look into the future and make simulations about what might happen. I wanted to look at every possible move my snake could make, and then from each of those moves, every possible move my opponents could make, and build up a tree of the possible moves in the future. This strategy of creating a tree of possible games is generally called tree searching. And the start of any good tree search algorithm is building up the tree of possible moves and game states. So let's take a look at what that looks like for Battlesnake here. We'll start with our current game state as the root of our eventual tree. You can see we got two snakes on the board, just to make it nice and simple for us. And we're going to be the purple-blue snake, and we're going to start simulating moves in the future. So first, we're going to look at all the possible moves we could make. We could go up, so we make a copy of the game board and move our snake up a square. Or we could go right, so we make a copy of our game board and move our snake to the right. And finally, we could go down. We make another copy and move our snake down. Um, and in this case, it doesn't really make sense for my snake to go left, because I'd run right into my own body. So we're going to only look at the three moves here. 
And you can see that my head is moving to different squares in these bottom boards. My snake is moving as we're simulating moves. So now we can repeat this process for my opponent's moves. For each of the new nodes that we just created, we can branch again for each move my opponents could make. When, my, when I go up, my opponent could go in any of those three directions, so we create a branch for each of them. And same thing for our right subtree. And finally, for our down subtree. So you can see that this tree is getting really big really quickly. It's growing exponentially. After just one turn, which is two layers of our tree, we already have nine leaf nodes, nine nodes in this bottom row here. And if we kept going and went to two turns, or a depth of four, we'd end up with 81 nodes in our tree. So each turn, the number of nodes is increasing by nine times, or the number of leaf nodes is increasing by nine. Most of my snakes use min-max, which is a specific tree search algorithm. We're not going to get into the details of it too much, but basically it works by giving a score to all of those bottom leaf nodes and using those scores to figure out which move is best. If you're interested in that, find me after and I'll, I'd love to explain more about min-max. But the base of that means the further down our tree we can look, the more into the future we can simulate, the better a move my snake can make, the better they can understand what might happen and make a good move. So when I got started with this and got my first tree search working, my snake could simulate about four turns into the future on average. And we were going to talk mostly about duels games of battle snakes, where there's two snakes on the board. So in one of those duels games, I could look at about 6,500 game states, or score about 6,500 game states in the 500 milliseconds I had. And so today we'll see how different Rust learnings help me boost my speed and fortune telling abilities of my snakes. So back to Rust. With our Battlesnake intro out of the way, it's time to talk about our first learning. So when I got started with my snakes, I wasn't doing anything to really measure the performance. But I knew that that was something I was going to need to do if I was going to get a lot faster. So every time I wanted to try something and make it faster, what I'd have to do before is deploy my snake and wait for like 100 games to run overnight. And that works but it meant that I had about a 24-hour delay sometimes between making a change and being able to see how I did. And that feedback loop was way too long. It just meant I wasn't able to iterate as fast as I'd like to. And I wanted a better way to measure the performance of my snakes. And thanks to Rust and Cargo, it was pretty easy to know where to get started here. When I, was, I hadn't really written benchmarks before when I got started playing Battlesnake, but I knew I needed to measure performance, and that's where benchmarks come in. It was awesome to learn that benchmarks were built right into Rust and Cargo. I didn't need to do anything special, and they worked just as easy as tests for what I needed. I just added the bench attribute above some function that I wanted to time, and then I could call it with cargo bench from the CLI, and that was about it. This is a non-snake example, but you can see that you know, we ran this bench pow function, and Cargo told us that it took about 47 nanoseconds per iteration. And this was awesome. This taught me that benchmarks could be easy, and they could live right in my code with my other tests. It didn't have to be this whole big other system. I loved how, how easy it could be. And I was measuring my code, and I was able to see what changes made things faster and what made things slower. This had got me a bit more scientific. Now instead of making random changes and hoping for the best, I could measure the performance of my snake and know for sure when I made things better. And after learning about benchmarks, We'd, I made things a bit faster. I poked around a bit randomly and tried, th tried some things out. I had some small gains here, some failed experiments there, but finally things were adding up and I was seeing some pretty big improvements. I could now look at over 20,000 board states in my 500 milliseconds. I was about four and a half turns into the future. But to squeeze out even more performance, we're gonna be, need to be a little bit more focused than just knowing if a change made something faster or slower. And that's where flame graphs came in. Flame graphs helped me shine light on code that I might want to look at, code that might be slow or might be worth investigating. We're going to look at a simplified example flame graph here so they're easier to see on the slides. Flame graphs helped show me where my snake was spending its time. They work by taking stack traces while your code runs and graphing how many times different functions are called. Each block here represents a different function. Flame graphs work from the bottom up, so starting at the bottom, you can see some setup functions for our benchmark. We got a main function, and then we got our benchmark function. And then these functions call our actual snake logic. And you can see it's a level above our setup code. The higher up these blocks go, the higher up the call stack we are. So you can see that make move here is the top of this call stack. 
And the more horizontal space a bar takes up, or maybe multiple bars that are the same function, that's the more time your program spent in that function. And so with my new flame graph knowledge, I was able to find some low-hanging fruit in my snake and make my snake just that much faster. I was able to get to about five turns into the future here. But in a flame graph, taking up a lot of horizontal space doesn't necessarily mean that that function is slow. It could be a relatively quick function that's called a lot. It's something that you do a ton of times, even though each time it's fast individually. And after a few rounds of iterations with my flame graphs, that's what I found. I found a function that I hadn't really considered before. And it was fast to call once, but I was calling it so many times that it was adding up. And that function was clone. Clone was being called a lot, and my snakes were spending a significant portion of their time making copies of various structs. I came from Ruby, so thinking about memory like this was new to me, and something that Rust was teaching me along the way. When I got started with my snakes, coming from Ruby, I didn't understand lifetimes and references super well. So when I got my first implementation working, I was simply cloning everywhere. I didn't know about lifetimes, I didn't want to think about them yet. So every function I wrote took ownership of its arguments. So each time I wanted to call a function that needed a copy of my structs, I simply cloned them. And the biggest offense was in my tree search code that we looked at before. Starting from our root, every time we needed to make a branch to simulate a new move, I'd make a copy of our original game board. And then I'd, make, then I'd move the snake on that copy. And I didn't really think about what was happening under the hood here. I just saw clone as a way to make, my, make the compiler happy and let me pass my game state to my functions. But eventually, Rust taught me to see each clone call for the benefit it was. Each clone call was work. We needed to allocate some memory and then copy the data over from our original structures and put it in these new ones. And if I worked on hunting down and removing all these clone calls from my tree search, we could speed things up. So we're gonna go clone hunting quick. So we have a new goal. Instead of our tree search making a clone for each node of the tree, what if we had a single board that we could pass around? We can start with our original board at the root again, but now to move down the tree, we can take our existing board and modify it. And if we do this in just the right order, we can walk this single board through the entire tree. We can make this first move and explore this node of the tree. And then we can reverse that node move and get back to our original board state at the root. And we can repeat this for the other moves we're simulating. Make a move and then reverse it. And the cool part is, even though we're only looking at a small tree to fit on the slide, this same pattern will work for any size tree and still only keep this one board instance. And this removed a ton of my clone calls. Now instead of making a copy or a clone each, for each of our board state for every branch, I could keep a single board state throughout the entire uh, function call, the entire 500 milliseconds. Um, and for this to work, we do need something new that I hadn't mentioned before. We need to know how to make a move and then also reverse that move. So before we knew how to move a snake with the move they made, and now we need to know how to reverse that move. But with these two functions, move and reverse move, we can take one board state and walk it through our entire tree without any clones. So woohoo, we did it. We got rid of all of our clones and our clone war was over. And through hunting down and clearing out all the, all the clones, I began to understand data ownership a little better and when it made sense to take something by reference versus moving it. The Rust compiler was there to show me who owned the data and how it was moving between various functions. The compiler was there every step of the way to make sure I obeyed the borrowing rules. And since I was learning, I really found this as a great learning tool. I could try things and experiment with things and know that the compiler was always there to have my back and catch any mistakes I made and keep me both safe and fast. So with all of those clones and needless memory allocations removed, we're getting faster. Now my snake could look about six turns into the future. And that means we're looking at something like 500,000 boards in half a second. We're looking about 1,000 board states in a millisecond. But one of the great things about Battlesnake is that it is a competitive game. So there was always a reason to keep improving. There's always more games to win and new opponents to beat. So let's go back to those flame graphs again and see if we can see anything new. And uh-oh, we can see two functions that we just talked about are taking over our flame graphs. 
we're back to move and reverse move. So it was faster to reverse these moves than making clones, but I was still spending a significant portion of my time simulating moves and then reversing them. I was still spending about 70% of my time in these two functions. And this is where I got a little stumped for a bit. Our flame graphs were pointing us to move and reverse move, but I didn't really have any ideas on how to make them faster. But that's when something kind of awesome happened. A gift was dropped on my lap and the rest of the Battlesnake community. A solution to most of these problems appeared in the form of a new rust crate specifically crafted for Battlesnake. And somehow even cooler, it was made at least partially on live stream by fellow Battlesnake community member Fable and our own Sage from the Rust Foundation. And Battlesnake Game Types was born. Battlesnake Game Types was built from the ground up to be fast. It optimized both for a small memory footprint and also to make simulating moves fast. And that simulating bit is exactly what we were looking for, right? We wanted to be able to make these moves as fast as possible. So I want to show why this new representation was so much faster for, for simulating. But I think to do that, we're going to look at the original representation first. So this is the struct I was using originally to represent my board. This represents the whole game state of Battlesnake. We store the height and width of our board so we know how big the board is to move around on. In the diagrams we've been seeing, that's been 7 by 7. And we have a VEC that contains the positions of all the food on the board, where all those red food pellets are. And we have a VEC of all the snakes that are in the game right now. And each snake struct looks something like this. It has a VEC that contains its body positions, so this tells us where the snake's body is. The first element in this VEC is going to be the snake's head, and we're going to work our way down to the tail. So the last item then is going to be the snake's tail. And each snake also knows its health. And finally, we have the position struct. This holds the x and y coordinate for that particular position. This was used for the food vector and those body vectors of the individual snakes. OK, so now we've seen how we store the board. Let's take a look at what simulating one move would look like, just to get an idea. We'll start with this board on the left, and we want to move this purple snake up. So if we take a look at that, the body vec of that purple snake, it has these four positions, starting with the head at index 0 and the tail at index 3. The first thing we're going to do to simulate a move is we're going to shuffle down all the current board positions, removing the tail as we do. We still want our snake to be four long, so we're not changing the size of the vec right now. We're just moving all of the items. This moves the tail and also makes room for our new head. Then we can insert the new head at position 0 of our index, and we've updated our body vector to now have the, the correct positions for this snake. And this worked great, but it wasn't really fast, right? Each time we made a snake move, we had to reorder this whole vector. These add up, especially when we're simulating half a million moves in a second. So Battlesnake Game Types does it a bit differently. Here we have a cell board that represents the entire uh, board in Battlesnake. It holds an array of cells equal to the size of the board. So in our 7 by 7 examples, we have 49 cells um, in this struct. And I've labeled all the cells here by their index, just to make them easier to see. In Battlesnake, 0, 0 is the bottom left corner, so we start with that as our 0 index. And each one of those cells is represented by this small struct. We store an index representing which, if any, snake holds that square, or if maybe there's a piece of food on that square. And then we have the secret sauce kind of here for these simulations. We store this next index. And this is used to point to the index of the cell that's the next snake body piece. And we're going to need a diagram to explain that a, a, a bit better. So for a cell that holds the head of a snake, it's going to point to the tail. So you can see our head there is pointing to the tail of the snake. And for each other cell that contains a snake body piece, it points towards the head. They kind of create a nice little circle here. So with this structure, if we know the head of a snake, we can find all its other body pieces by following these little pointers. We hop from the head to the tail, and then from the tail, we work our way through the snake body until we make it back to the head. So let's see what we need to simulate a move. We're going to look at the same move we looked at a second ago. So here's our original board, and I've drawn those next indexes just as arrows and got rid of the numbers to make it easier to see. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to find the cell that corresponds to where our new head is going to be. So we want it to move up. So we take that square, the cell that was one up, 
We set its snake index to like one for my snake maybe. And we point the head to where our new tail is gonna be. So you can see we're pointing to not the old tail, but the new tail here. And then we can update a few more of those next indexes. We can make our old head point to the new head. It's not a head anymore, so now it just points towards the head. And we can store where the new head of our snake is so that we can eventually follow the path again. And with that, we could simulate a forward move. And this took way less operations than reordering my vex did before. We just had to swap out a few pointers, basically, and we were good to go. So I plugged Battlesnake game types into my snakes, and it led to some pretty good improvements. Now we could see about six and a half turns into the future. And six and a half turns is about 1.5 million game states for a duels game of Battlesnake. And that's in under half a second. But there is one more optimization in Battlesnake game types that I want to talk about quick. And it's that the, game, the, the crate was also optimized for size. The standard cell board that we looked at that holds the entire board state is only a static 382 bytes. And this is way smaller than my VEC-based approach. And importantly, it was way easier to clone. Instead of working with vectors and having to create a new vector and then add all the original data in, I was now working with arrays where we knew the size. So it was a simple memory copy to clone my board and make a new one with this new representation. And since reverse move was something that our flame graphs had pointed us before, I was interested in making that faster. And what better way to make it faster than just remove it? I experimented one day with going back to clones. Since this new compact representation was so much cheaper to clone, it was actually cheaper than it was to reverse the moves like I was doing before. So switching to a new memory representation made things a lot faster, but also kind of invalidated some of my previous learnings, which was just a, a fun learning experience for me. So with bringing back the clones, we were now able to look seven turns into the future. And in our duels game of Battlesnake, where we simulate three moves for each snake, that's something like 4.78 million game states that we're going to look at in just under half a second. We're scoring almost 100,000 game states in a single millisecond here. So with all this work and all these learnings, where do we fall on the leaderboard? It's a screenshot from the player rankings dashboard on Battlesnake. And we're doing pretty well, if I do say so myself. I'm currently sitting at eighth place in the global leaderboard with my snakes. And there are some really awesome competitors and developers in that leaderboard, so I'm really proud of making it into the top 10 there. And if you look at the language tags that some of these developers have added to your, their snakes, you can see that four of us in the top 10 are using Rust for our snakes. And I think that's really cool to see. Rust has kind of taken over Battlesnake a little bit in the last few years, and it's been fun. And that's all the time I have today for this talk. I didn't even begin to scratch the surface of all the things Rust let me learn and explore with Battlesnake, or that Battlesnake let me learn and explore with Rust. I've been able to explore threads, async, locks, and atomics, all with the comfort and safety that the Rust compiler provides. Thanks for everyone who came out today, and for everyone watching on stream. Feel free to find me after the talk if you have any questions about Battlesnake or anything else I mentioned. I'll be on Discord right after this to answer questions, and I'll post some links to Battlesnake if anyone's interested in trying it out. And if you're here in person, I'll be wearing a Battlesnake shirt for most of the conference to be easy to find. And I'll also have some Battlesnake stickers for everyone who wants to, who, for anyone who wants one. Just come find me. Thanks again. And remember, never stop learning.